Because uh, uh, for me, Machiavelli is not just a subject of scholarly um, investigation. I would say that uh, I, it's uh, almost a friend. I've been studying Machiavelli for now 30, 32 years. When I uh, am in Italy, I spend much time, as much time as I can in Florence, to work in the Biblioteca Nazionale, uh, because most of Machiavelli's papers are there. But every morning before I reach the Biblioteca Nazionale, I stop by Santa Croce, where Machiavelli is buried. I enter in the church, and uh, I go to pay him a visit. I say, Nicolo, how are you? Uh, have you been sleeping well? How's life going? And he responds to me. And so we have a nice conversation. Then rejuvenated, I reach the bibliotheque and I begin to read his texts. Tonight, I would like to briefly uh, present my argument, my thesis, the result of some years of investigation about the meaning, the meaning of Machiavelli's prints. When I say meaning, I intend what Machiavelli intended to write, what Machiavelli wanted to say in the prints, the reason, the primary reason for him to write the prints the way he wrote. So let me be <laughs> clarify. I'm not talking about what the prints might mean for us. We can find in that text many meanings. Each of us can find different meanings. What I wanted to try to convey and share with you, waiting for your criticisms and remarks, is what Machiavelli really wanted to say in that book. And my view is that Niccolò Machiavelli composed the prince in 1513 not to get a job from the Medici as it has been said thousands of times, not to get a job from the Medici. Not to assert that politics is autonomous from ethics. Yet another commonplace about Machiavelli. And not even to found or establish or inaugurate the modern science of politics. This, too, is an idea that you find in every, every handbook or history of political thought. Niccolò Machiavelli composed the prince to design, invoke, educate a possible redeemer of Italy, a great political and military leader capable of creating with God's help. Don't faint, don't call a lawyer, don't call an ambulance. I am, I know what I'm saying, with God's help is in the text. Someone who with God's help could redeem Italy from the barbarians. To put it differently, what I am asserting is that the meaning of the prince is in the last chapter, whose title is Exhortation to Liberate Italy from the Barbarians. So if we want to understand the prince, we should read the last chapter first. An oration, and we explain that, an oration on the Redeemer. That's what the prince is. That is what Machiavelli wanted the prince to be. You know, the, let me clarify the argument and offer, if possible, some textual basis for it. You, I'm sure you know the exhortation, the last chapter. is the chapter in which Machiavelli compares the conditions of Italy to the conditions of the people of Israel, to the Jews in Egypt, when they were 
in the Egyptian bondage. He also compares the condition of Italy to that of the Athenians before they were unified by Theseus and to the condition of the Persians under the Medes' yoke before they were emancipated by Cyrus. Machiavelli writes, Italy at the time, I'm now reading three lines in Italian, just to give you the flavor of Machiavelli's ways of writing, he, the way, and then translated. L'Italia si riducesse nei termini presenti, che fosse più stiava che gli ebrei, più serva che persi, più dispersa che gli ateniesi, senza capo, senza ordine, battuta, spogliata, lacera, corsa, e avessi sopportato ogni sorte di ruina. Italy was more enslaved than the Hebrews, more survived than the Persians, more scattered than the Athenians, without a leader, without order, beaten, despoiled, ripped apart, overrun, and having suffered every sort of ruin. It doesn't sound exactly the same, but it's all right. Then Machiavelli speaks of Italy as praying God. That's prega si vede come ella prega di Italy, praise God. By the way, I'm not a believer, I'm not a Christian. I am a secular person, but I'm an historian. So I have the duty to try to extract from the text what Machiavelli was saying. And if he speaks of God, I have to say he speaks of God. And by God, he means the God of the Bible, as you will see in a moment. She prays someone to redeem her. Prega Dio che mandi qualcuno che la redima. Then Machiavelli says that if the, a great political leader will emerge, Italy will follow him. Then he stresses that if, Machiavelli here ends the exhortation speaking as if he were a prophet. In fact, he writes, that although the great redeemers like Moses, Cyrus, and Theseus were rare and marvelous men, he writes, they were nevertheless men. And each of them had poorer opportunities than are offered now. And there you, dear redeemer, you will have God as a friend. God as a friend. If you commit yourself to the achievement of emancipating Italy. An oration on the Redeemer. You see how strong is this idea of the redemption in the last chapter. Do I have some evidences to claim that not that Machiavelli <laughs> uh, composed the exhortation, everybody can read it, but that Machiavelli composed the prince having in view the exhortation. Let me make three consideration. The first, let's look at Machiavelli's entire corpus. The theme of uh, political redemption from tyranny, from corruption, from foreign domination is present from the first, from the earliest works until the last one. He composed discourses on Livy in order to teach, to educate future generations of Italians to emancipate themselves from moral corruption. He composed The Art of War, published in 1521, to try to inspire the resurrection of ancient Italian military orders, meaning the Romans. And uh, he even composed an essay in 1520, a discourse on the reform of uh, the Constitution of Florence, in which Machiavelli presents a eulogy, words of great praise for those men who have been able to reform republics using the laws. He said that this kind of men are second only to the gods in terms of excellence and moral virtue. But there is more than that, not only the books. In all his life, Machiavelli tried to want to believe the possibility of a redeemer. In, Mar in March 15, 1526, that is to say, a year, last year of his life, he died in 1527, he believed that Giovanni dalle Bande Nere, the son of uh, 
Caterina Sparza might have been the redeemer of it. We have a beautiful letter to Guicciardini saying, he is, he could be. A few months later, in uh, May, he writes again, Guicciardini, saying that there, are, there is again, in 1526, the opportunity to liberate Italy from the barbarians. That is to say, we have here a man who focused all his works on the idea of the redemption of Italy, redemption from corruption, redemption from tyranny. We have a man who has dedicated all his life to this task. Well, it seems to be reasonable to assert that he has composed the prince precisely to shape, to design the myth of a political redeemer of Italy. Second argument in favor, what is the prince about? I know the answer. It's about politics. No, it's not. It's not about politics. It's about grand politics. Machiavelli writes it explicitly. I'm going to write about gli uomini eccellentissimi. I'm going to write about i grandissimi esempi. The greatest men. Who are these most excellent men for Machiavelli? I know the answer. Caesar Borgia, that's false. The, the real heroes are Cyrus, Romulus, Theseus, and above all, Moses. These are the great, the eccellentissimi examples to be imitated. The second piece of evidence that I, I'd like to offer you is that uh, Machiavelli, already in chapter 6, indicates the theme of chapter 26. That is to say, he directs the, lead, the reader to the idea of the Redeemer. He speaks again of Romulus, Moses, Cyrus, and Theseus, who had the opportunity to show their virtue because their countries were in a situation of dramatic sufferings. They had the opportunity, and they were capable of seizing the opportunity, showing their extraordinary virtue. The uh, third indication, the third suggestion, third argument that I would like to offer to uh, sustain that Machiavelli composed the prince having in mind the final exhortation is the structure of the text, the style of the text. What kind of text is Machiavelli's prince? We have to ask. Machiavelli's prince has been written not as a philosophical text and not even as a piece or an essay of political science. I'm sorry about my colleagues. They are wrong. Machiavelli never wrote as a political science. If they want to find an ancestor or a saint protector, they should look elsewhere. Machiavelli composed the prince from the first page until the last one following the rules of the Ars Rhetoric. That is to say, rhetoric. Rhetoric is the discipline that teaches you how to speak and write with persuasive power in order not just to convince someone that what you're saying is right or useful or possible, but in order to move someone to act. Machiavelli uses metaphors. Machiavelli uses images, Machiavelli uses examples. The entire structure of the book is, follows the structure of the oration. Begins with a, an introduction, then there is a division of the subject, then there are arguments for, arguments against, there is a summary, and there is an exhortation. An oration, that's what Machiavelli's prince is. Now, you're going to say, Professor Viral, what does that have to do with your idea? It has something to do, and it's this. Rule number one of eloquence, in case you are interested in going into politics, remember, if, when you make a political speech, you must be sure that you say the most important thing for you at the end, because that's exactly what they remember. And what do we find at the end of Machiavelli's priest? Exhortation to liberate Italy, in which Machiavelli touches all the passions that you need to touch in such a context.
context in order to, in order to be able to move them to act. There, is only, there are many objections that can be raised against my thesis. I only mentioned the most lethal one, and I leave the others to you. <laughs> the really devastating critique is that Machiavelli composed the exhortation after he had composed the bulk of the prince. Namely, some scholars say he has co completed the prince, we know, the bulk, the main corpus, by December 1513. We are getting close to the real date. And uh, they, uh, some say he has written it in 1515, uh, he has written the exhortation. 1516, he has written the exhortation. 1518, there are various opportunities with this. How can I claim that, in fact, Machiavelli composed the exhortation along with the rest of the book? I have many uh, philological textual evidences, but just allow me to mention one. In, uh, Machiavelli says that you, Medici, you have the chance to be the redeemers of Italy, uh, your family, which is now prince, che della quale ora è principe. It means that the Medici are the princes of Flores and they have a pope. Uh, Leo X is Giovanni de Medici. Now in Italian, and I see that, I know there are many Italians here, the adverb ora means now. Machiavelli could not possibly have, have said that you are now prince of the, of the church in 1515, 16, or 18, because Giovanni de' Medici was elected pope in March 1513. So if he says ora, he refers to an event that was close in time. But I'm going to end my too long presentation. In my opinion, the real evidence that Machiavelli cannot possibly have composed the exhortation after 15, the beginning, the early months of 1514, to say, or we can say, is his life. You see, we scholars, we tend to focus on concepts, language, ideas, arguments. We have to remember that books are written by human beings, believe it or not. And they have lives, even passions, beliefs. Now let's consider who was Niccolò Machiavelli between 1513 and 1518. Well, there is a, a correspondence, a beautiful citation. We can get back to those. It's very clear. Machiavelli lost his post as secretary of the Republic in 1512. He was imprisoned in February 1513, released March 11, around uh, 1513, when uh, Giovanni de' Medici was elected pope. Now, until... Uh, December 1513, we see a man who is deeply wounded. He signs letters, quantum secretary, I am the former secretary, meaning he writes what he is no longer, not who he is. But he is a man who tries to fight back, to resurrect, to be again himself. After 1514, he is a different man. There is a marvelous letter of August 3rd, 1514, in which Machiavelli says, I no longer delight, non mi diletta più, leggere le antiche cose, to read ancient history, to reflect on the works of the great men of antiquity. All I care about is love. I am in love, and I thank for that Venus and, and Cyprus. No longer delights me. But the same man, six months earlier in December, had written that for him to think and read and write about grand politics had the power of resurrecting him, of making him feel himself. Non e per quattro ore dimentico ogni affanno, dimentico ogni paura, non mi sbigottisce la morte. He was not even afraid of death when he was reading and writing about grand politics. In 1514, he tells you, that he is no longer interested in all that. A man in that position that could not have written a text full of hope, strength, moral energy, like the exhortation. There is much more than that. 
one uh, last remark. How does Machiavelli's prince end? With uh, some lines taken from Petrarch. Virtù contro furore prendere l'armi e il fio il combatter corto perché negli italici petti l'antico valor non è ancora morto. Virtue against fury will pick up arm and the fight shall be sure because Italian valor has not yet dead. Why you end an essay on the prince with the verses of the poet? Because Machiavelli believed in the prophetic power of poetry. Poets, he writes, have sometimes divine and prophetic power. That gives us something to um, think about, about the meaning of that text. The text that ends with words of Petra because, not because he thought that this the words by Petra were particularly elegant. No, because he thought Petra poets have the prophetic power. What is then the conclusion? There are many conclusions, but allow me to mention just one. Why, of all the books similar to The Prince, only The Prince is surviving? And in good health. In good health. I think for this reason. Because Machiavelli's Prince is about political redemption as he said. Political redemptions are rare events in the lives of peoples. You can count them in one hand. But as aspirations or hopes, the hope to see grand politics, the hope to see uh, moral and political regeneration is a profoundly and wide, uh, profoundly widespread aspiration in the minds of peoples over the century. And Machiavelli's text responds to that. And there is even more. I think that readers over the centuries, I have some evidences, that perceive that while Machiavelli was writing about the redemption of Italy, he was trying to redeem himself. I think this is the reason uh, why Machiavelli's prince is still so powerful. The day when no one will read Machiavelli's Prince will be, I think, the, will mean that we have lost even the hope to see grand politics. It won't be a happy day. Thank you for your patience. Grazie. Grazie, grazie, grazie. Professor Viroli, it's really a pleasure to have you here at the IDB, and thank you for this great uh, words of introduction and opening this great reflection on Machiavelli. Let me start uh, this dialogue and, or this interview with, with one image. You have it here in the screen, here in the back. You see Niccolo Machiavelli. In your, in your first uh, biography, or in your biography, Niccolo Smile, you say something very interesting. You say, you're right, that I have always been fascinated by Machiavelli, by his political thinking and writing, but especially by the way in which he laughed about life and other people. What was he laughing about? He was laughing about what you can laugh about, namely human weaknesses, the weaknesses that are not that dramatic. The weakness of being glutton, the weakness of falling in love, if it is a weakness, jealousy. That's why Machiavelli wrote, composed a beautiful comedy, Mandragora. And that's why he was a, a good comic writer. He was laughing about himself, about his own passions. He wrote, composed another comedy, Clizia, mm -hmm. in which the main character, his name is Nico Macco. And the, the comedy is about an old man who falls in love with a much younger, very attractive woman, a tragic circumstance. And of course, he was portraying on the, on the stage, on, uh, he was putting on theater his own condition, because at the time, everyone knew that he was in love with a younger woman. But Machiavelli, also, he was laughing about what you can laugh about. Let's say excusable human weaknesses. But he was extremely serious, terrifyingly serious about 
serious and grave matters like liberty, mm -hmm. like the dignity of your country, the rule of law, the end uh, about principles. That's Machiavelli, capable of being light, transgressive, humorful, playful, when it was the time to be so. But extremely serious when the matters were required uh, gravity and principles. That's why I like him. Because normally what you have, in many cases, you have that principled people are not, do not have irony. And, and the people who laugh, they tend to laugh about everything, including, including things you should not laugh about. Allow me to conclude that we Italians, I'm an American citizen, but I was born in the we Italians. One of our vices is that we tend to laugh about everything. No, like even about things you should be extremely serious about. Machiavelli was both serious and was the, was the time to be serious, playful, <laughs> was the time of being brave. He was, his nickname in, uh, in Florence was Machia, yeah. Il Machia. He was the center of the brigade, humorful, funny, and it was the time to be humorful and funny. Thank you so much. So let me go back a little bit back in time. Sure. Because we know about the greatness of, of Machiavelli. Here we see the great Florence. And uh, Machiavelli was born in a family uh, his father, Bernardo Machiavelli, his mother, Bartolomea de Nelli, nurtured some values on him. He had access to a library. He had access to, to goods that shaped his, his character, his virtues. What can you tell us about the education and, and, and his ascent as, as, as this individual that has so much uh, uh, knowledge and, and profound uh, uh, desire to, to shape society? That's a very good question. We know very little about Niccolò Machiavelli between for, before 1498, when he was appointed second chancellor of the Republic of Florence in charge of foreign affairs, more or less. What do we know about Niccolò be, before, between 1469 and 1498? We know that what he studied, Latin, grammar, rhetoric. We even know the books on rhetoric that his father owned. History. Machiavelli did not know Greek. He couldn't afford the preceptor. And uh, one other important element that we know of uh, Machiavelli is that he copied, transcribed with his own hands Lucretius, uh, De Rerum Natura. And um, you know what, what kind of poet Lucretius was? Lucretius portrayed a very disconsolate vision of uh, humankind. Certainly Machiavelli remained deeply influenced by the idea that we human beings, we are extremely fragile. When we are born, we are naked. And we cry, solo gli uomini piangono quando... We are the only, uh, he believed, creatures that cry when they come to life. And moreover, Machiavelli stresses writing about Lucretius, we are extremely cruel. The cruelty that human beings are capable of are, as you know, undescribable. Yet, uh, Machiavelli believed that there are also human beings who can be of great magnanimity of soul, human beings who aim at great things in life, human beings who are capable of resembling God, not being like God, resembling through their own virtue, their own commitment to great ideals. So that's what you get from Machiavelli, earlier uh, years, the earliest years of, of his life. There is also, we have also some documents that indicate that he was close to Giuliano de' Medici. 
But I think that when uh, he became secretario, he uh, detached himself from the Medici circles. This is speculation. Let's look at the facts. After 1498, uh, Machiavelli was the secretary of the Republic, and uh, he became totally dedicated to the service of his own Republic. So I think that Machiavelli, after 1498, changed remarkably in comparison to what he was before 1498. Thank you, Professor. If we analyze Machiavelli, as you suggest, we must also look at uh, the times uh, that he experienced in his, in his youth. So here are the Medicis. He was, he was born during Il Magnifico's time, and he grew up uh, experiencing the Patsy conspiration, as you will, note in, in Nicolas' smile. But my question is, was he inspired by, by Lorenzo il Magnifico? D did, he, did he see in him values or, 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 or elements of greatness that are present in his works? You said the right word, greatness. As you know, in between 1521 and 15. 25, Machiavelli composed the Paris, the Florentine histories. And in the Florentine histories, the Historia Fiorentine, Machiavelli wrote a long eulogy. He wrote words of praise for Lorenzo the Magnificent. He recognized Lorenzo's greatness. But if you carefully read Machiavelli's uh, pages on the Medici, including Lorenzo, you notice something very interesting. You notice that Machiavelli uh, dedicates a remarkable space to the opinions of the enemies of the Medici on the Medici. <laughs> he gives voice to the opponents of the Medici. And what exactly Machiavelli was uh, allowing the enemies of the Medici to say. Notice that this is an extremely interesting uh, situation because uh, Machiavelli composed the Florentine histories under the, under the guidance of commission. The war was commissioned by Clemens VII. Clemens VII was Giulio de' Medici. And yet in the, he managed to insert in the text, in the text, clear voices of severe reprobation of the Medici's policy. Which policy? Machiavelli sharply criticized. And he criticized the same policy also in The Prince. That's why The Prince is not written for the Medici. The po la, la politica dei favori, the policy of favors, what Machiavelli calls le vie private, what, uh, what, what, what did he mean? He meant this, that the Medici were able to attain their power in Florence by distributing favors to friends through money, connections, patronage. The mechanism was very simple. Uh, the Medici knew that someone needed money to establish uh, some business. Here is the money. Someone needed money Somebody else needed money to marry a daughter. He needed a dowry at the time. Here is the money. You want to be elected to the great council? I help you. Do you have problems with the magistrate, with justice? I can take care of that. That was the Medici system. The system of patronage through which many Florentines became loyal to the Medici. Therefore, the Medici were in the position of asking for support. In this way, they became, particularly Cosimo, between 1434 and 1464 is a long time, 30 years, the de facto rulers of Florence. But uh, Machiavelli did not admire at all this style of, of political action. He stresses that if you follow that type of uh, style of government, 
all you can build is a mediocre, weak republic. There is no true greatness in distributing favors, in sustaining corruption. That's uh, the major critique that Machiavelli uh, developed about Lorenzo and all the Medici. And uh, why is that particularly relevant for the prince? Because if you write a book to please the Medici, and Machiavelli knew this very well, you have to write ideas that the Medici will love to read, not severe criticisms of their policy as Machiavelli, as Machiavelli did. To put it shortly, in, when Machiavelli composed the prince, he wanted to try to help, to educate, or to inspire a new Moses, not another Cosimo. Now, if we analyze the prince and think of all these historic and life context that, that um, impacted on Machiavelli, there are two figures that I would like to, to ask you about. One is uh, Girolamo Savonarola. Machiavelli listened to his uh, sermons, and uh, he saw the emergence of the re republic after the fall of the Medici. And then the other figure is, is uh, Piero de Soderini, Piero Gonfaloniero Superior. He was sort of a mentor to Machiavelli. He trusted him. He gave him the opportunity to become a truthful secretary. How these two figures are reflected in the prince? It's always a question that, Mark, that, that comes to my mind. That's, that's a very good question. In chapter six, Machiavelli uh, writes down a line that has become famous. Tutti li profeti disarmati ruinorno, tutti li profeti armati vinsono. All unarmed prophets failed, all armed prophets triumphed. The example of the unarmed prophet was Savonarola. Savonarola, as you know, between uh, 1492 and 1494, persuaded with his uh, uh, eloquence, with his prophetic language, the Florentines to establish the Republican government in 1494. But in 1498, the Republic under the pressure of the Vatican, allowed Savonarola to be tried and strangled and burned in Piazza Signoria. So he failed. He was ultimately defeated. And uh, the idea that many commentators have uh, stressed is that Machiavelli was disdainful, was condescendent about Savonarola. I don't think so. In Discourses, uh, book one, Discourses on Livy, book one, chapter 12, Machiavelli writes, of such a man, di tanto uomo si deve parlare con rispetto, of such a man you must speak respectfully. Of course, Mac uh, Savonarola was unarmed, but Machiavelli respected prophecy. And uh, when he, uh, Machiavelli opposes the armed prophet, that is to say the political leader, who is capable of inspiring with the power of words, but also is able to keep human beings, the followers, the people persuaded with the power of arms, of the sword. But here it doesn't mean that the, the leader, the redeemer, should not be a prophet. Because how, you gener how do you generate uh, devotion and loyalty and faith if you're not capable of speaking with persuasive and prophetic power. So what I'm saying is that for Machiavelli, uh, Savonarola was lacking because he was unarmed, but he was important because he was a prophet. So Machiavelli wanted a leader who was prophetic like Savonarola, but armed with, armed, with, with the power of, of the sword. And of Soderini, Soderini was more than, was the patron of Machiavelli. Machiavelli was working, uh, Soderini was, would be the equivalent of President Obama in Florence. And Machiavelli, something less than a Secretary of State. In, 
ماکیاولی has very harsh words, very harsh words about Soderini. What was Machiavelli imputing to Soderini? He imputed Soderini, who was, a, under many respects, a remarkable political leader, very honest, great integrity, complete devotion to the uh, republic, very distant from policies of, from corrup of corruption. He imputed Soderini not uh, to, have, to have been unable to use extraordinary means to defend the Republic when the Republic was attacked in 1512 and ultimately defeated. There, is a, there are some terrifying words that Machiavelli wrote about Soderini. La notte che morì Pier Soderini si presentò in inferno e Pluto rispose, cosa fai qui anima sciocca, vai nel limbo con i bambini. When Soderini died, he went to hell. And Pluto received him and said, what do you want here? That's not your place. Go to the limbo with the children. <laughs> Words that are, uh, that's why, why. Because Machiavelli believed that if you are a great political leader and the situation compels you to use extraordinary means, for instance, cruelty, for instance, not keeping your word, you have to have the force of doing it. If this is necessary to save the liberty of your country, you have to be able to do it. Now that you mention that, I have this, always this, this intriguing question that you also raise in, in Nicolas Smart. You say that it's, it remains a mystery why Machiavello was appointed at, at age 28 as second secretary of the Chancery. Somebody must have seen something special in him. Out of your research, it remains a mystery to you, or you have clarified some elements in recent research? Still, it's a mystery. Because Machiavelli did not belong to the political elite of Florence. He was not a notary. He was not a humanist. He had published nothing. Why was he called to such a position of responsibility? There are two hypotheses. The first is because he was an opponent of Savonarola. Savonarola was executed in May 1498. Machiavelli was elected, appointed second uh, chancellor, secretario in June. The coincidence speaks, indicates that the fall of Savonarola marked a political change in which the enemies of Savonarola were particularly powerful, and, and they rewarded Niccolò. The other is that the first chancellor of the Republic, Marcello di Virgilio Adriani, was a distinguished humanist, very close friend of Bernardo Machiavelli, the father of, of Niccolò. That is another possibility, that he loved, he, had, he admired this young man, and he appointed, uh, he, he helped to make possible the election of uh, uh, Machiavelli to the position of secretary. Remember that in Florence, an appointment like that had to be voted by the Great Council, something like the Senate, the American Congress. So it, it took, in, it was necessary a large majority, was uh, a renewable appointment year after year, but in principle could have been a lifetime appointment. Uh, but you see, I am an historian, so unless I have textual or documentary archival evidences, I don't like to go beyond hypotheses. The two that I have outlined are now in the scholarship, the ideas that are regarded as the most plausible. But still, we don't know. We know the others, the other candidates. <laughs> and I would like to think that in comparison with Niccolò, they were really, really mediocre. But we can say that now. <laughs> no one could have said that Nicolai in 1498 was such a distinguished and such a remarkable political, political uh, student of politics and advisor. So before we, can, we get to more in depth in, in the prints, you also raise in your book how the missions he embraced as a secretary shaped his vision of politics and power and greatness and state, statecraft. There are three figures that are present in, in your book 
and there are present in Machiavelli's works. Catalina Sforza, Louis XII, and Cesare Borgia. <laughs> Those three figures are very different, very complex, very, you can write a, a, a you know, dozens of books about each, uh, each character. But how do you see those three characters shaping special views that Machiavelli had on politics? Like what, what he took about uh, Catalina Sforza? What did he take away from Cesare de Borgia? And what did he learn from, from Luis XII that you raise in your book? Uh, excellent questions. He met Catalina Sforza in 1499. It was his first important diplomatic mission in Furli, my hometown. Caterina <laughs> uh, was the dukes of Furli. And uh, Machiavelli, as a diplomat, he had to write back to Florence every day a report. And it, it is clear that Machiavelli was deeply impressed by Caterina, a woman prince. He stresses that even if she loved her son, Giovanni, Giovanni dalle Bande Nere, she uh, was a remarkable prince. Actually, Machiavelli stresses, this is a marvelous line, that Caterina was canceling meetings when uh, her son was seriously sick. So she was a mother. But at the same time, she was a formidable princess. She was a warrior. And uh, Machiavelli took from Caterina the idea uh, that if you really want to be a great prince, you have to disp display outstanding virtue. Virtue in the sense of courage, determination, willingness to continue to fight even when the situation is almost desperate. Caterina remained in Machiavelli's imagination for many years, until Machiavelli's death. He wrote about her in the Discourses on Livy, around 1515. He wrote about her in the Florentine histories. And the story he uh, created, the myth, he created a myth about Caterina Sforza, a myth based on a legend that Machiavelli himself invented. So you see a realist, when people say Machiavelli is a realist, a realist who invented legends, but the legend of about Caterina Sforza is so spicy that I cannot describe and reveal it here. <laughs> you will read it. It's really too spicy. Machiavelli was really, could be, was able to be very, very, we say in America, graphic. <laughs> in, uh, from uh, the other impressive uh, meeting for him was uh, Caesar Borgia, the Duke Valentino, the son of the Pope Adrian VI. He met him twice in 1512, June and September, and then he saw him again in Rome in 1503 when, when he was declining. Of course, Machiavelli was deeply impressed by the military qualities of the Duke, his ruthlessness, his capacity of uh, disposing of his enemies, warlords. He admired uh, the Duke of all the, for all the qualities that were lacking in the Florentine government. Yet, and he saw, he, he believed that uh, Valentino was up to do something really great. But then, when Valentino was defeated, when Valentino declined, he has uh, no words of admiration for him. That is to say, the Duke did not make on Machiavelli a lasting impression. Uh, also, Machiavelli admired, was impressed by uh, the Duke Valentino's ability to practice politics as staging. Machiavelli was in Cesena on December 26, 1502. And he saw what the Valentino did with his lieutenant, Romiro de Orro. He put the body of Romiro cut into two pieces in the main square of Cesena to indicate to the peoples of Cesena that, what, to indicate what? Why such a barbarous execution? Why the staging? Well, Romero had been extremely cruel in order to restore order. 
but the people hated Romir. Therefore, therefore, the Duke, in order to appease the people, put, such, put up such a stage. Machiavelli noticed, tried to interpret the meaning of that gesture. And the meaning was, the Duke wanted to prove to everyone that just as he was able of uniting the peoples of Romania into a new political body, he had the power of dismembering a body. So the staging was an eloquent act, was a speech. And Machiavelli was interpreting that meaning. Of, uh, of the king of France, Machiavelli only says, <laughs> Machiavelli was quite a diplomat. <laughs> I, I'm sure uh, President Obama would immediately require his uh, resignation uh, had Machiavelli been appointed by the United States government as an ambassador. Because he was sent in, 15, in, in uh, 1500 to, to France to meet the king. Now you have to imagine the size. France was the greatest power of the time. Florence is a small republic. Now you send Machiavelli to speak to the prime minister, the Cardinal de Rouen, about important political matters. What is Machiavelli saying to the cardinal? Oh, he says, look, you French, you are saying that we Italians do not know how to organize an army, but you French, you understand absolutely nothing about the state. Nice words to say to a prime minister, imagine, in a, in a diplomatic context, that's exactly <laughs> what you should say. Machiavelli, however, stressed that the merit of the King of France was to have produced a unified country in which the power of the king was limited by the laws and by institutions such as the French Parliament, the Parlement, that were judicial bodies. So he admired the, what uh, the King of France had done for this reason is to say their capacity to build a unified state in which the king, however important, was not above the law. Now that, that we're talking about these figures that, that shaped Machiavelli that you raise in your book, and you talk about how Machiavelli wanted to redeem himself, there's a, a historical moment, Julius II. Machiavelli advises Soderini not to be neutral in a conflict where Pope Julius II was very active. And out of that neutrality, uh, the Republic turned apart. That's very, for Machiavelli, the greatest mistake you can do in politics, particularly in foreign politics, is to remain neutral when there is a conflict between two great powers, because and Machiavelli stresses, whoever wins will regard you as an enemy or as a, a, as a, a, a person who doesn't deserve respect or as a failed friend. So you lose in any case. You should have the courage to take a stand, to choose, to, to stay with one of the two and to behave loyally. And then, even if you have chosen to stay with the losing side, with the losing power, the winner will respect you. Whereas if you remain neutral, you might well lose respect. The word that Machiavelli uses is reputazione, reputation. For Machiavelli, the key of political power, of course, one of the, of the basis of the conditions in order to be power was to have an army, the size of the territory, the population, but above all, reputation. And if you remain neutral, you lose reputation. If you lose reputation, that is the worst possible defeat. Thank you, Professor. Now let me show you a picture of a place that I, I think you've been there many, many times. Many times. There is also one uh, wonderful tavern and the restaurant I recommend <laughs> it. This was Nicolo's house when he was in, in exile and basically where the prince was written. So the, the discourses, uh, Clizia, uh, Mandragora, all Machiavelli's works. He comes to this place in poverty, in exile, 
large family, scarce resources at the time. How do you think a person with so much emotions and so much frustration could have the discipline to sit down and look for his personal redemption writing those books in this place at those times? Because you, you raised that point, actually, in, in, in the book. Well, I'm, ve I'm very fond of Machiavelli's house and the tavern that ex is, uh, exists now there because uh, is, uh, I have very fond memories about it. In 1987, uh, my friends and colleagues organized a dinner for me to celebrate the fact that I was appointed at Princeton University many years ago. That was the, that was the changing moment of my life. We had a fabulous dinner around close to the fireplace. But personal memories apart, though they are important, the answer to your question is very simple. Precisely because Machiavelli was living in a condition of solitude, living the kind of life that was not his life, he tried uh, uh, all he could to resurrect. What was the kind of life that Machiavelli wanted to live? He wanted to live a life in which he had the possibility to do something great for his country. That what all his life has been uh, dedicated, dedicated all his energies to this, to this idea. You see, Machiavelli was not uh, joking at all. When he wrote in uh, December 10, 1513, he wrote that La mia povertà è la prova della mia onestà. My poverty is the evidence of my honesty. He served between 1498 through 1512 for the Republic. He was in control of enormous sums of money because he was paying the mercenaries cash. Those people did not take checks. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine you go and write a check to a mercenary. No, no, uh, he was carrying the money, the florins. Yet he was poorer in uh, 1512 than he was in 1419. So politics did not make him rich. In politics, he, he had the possibility to see how ungrateful human beings are, how mean they can be. But still, for him, to be in politics was the only chance to try to do something great. And when, at the end of his life, he wrote uh, in a letter, I amo la mia patria più della mia anima. I love my country more than my soul. He was perfectly serious. Now, for a man like this to live in Santander in Percussino, I'd love to live there. I would immediately sign an agreement with the with the mayor of Sant'Andrea, can I stay there for, until I die? Yeah, just read your books, a marvelous place, excellent wine. No, for Machiavelli that was painful, painful. So the only way he saw to be able to uh, be again himself <laughs> was to read the books the, of the ancient histories, to reflect on grand politics, to give life with a stroke of imagination to a redeemer. That's what Machiavelli did. To be able at least to think and write about grand politics since he was not allowed to practice it. In the letter of December 10, he says, e mi nutro di, e mi pasco di quel cibo che solum è mio, ed io nacqui per lui. I nourish myself for that food uh, that is my only food, my only nourishment. And I was born for it. And what is this knowledge, that food? is similar to the spiritual food of religion. It's the food that nourishes your soul, that allows you to be alive and to be yourself. What kind of food was it? was thinking about grand politics. That was what, precisely because he was defeated, he was able to write these two masterpieces, the discourses and the prince. You can, if you read with attention, you can see that, as I said, that the prince is the effort of a man who didn't want to give up the possibility of being himself. Thank you, Professor. Let me show you three pictures. This is the prince. 
Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And this is Isaiah Berlin. Mm -hmm. One of the, the great essays about Machiavelli was written by him called The Originality of Machiavelli. So let me put two questions to you. First, Machiavelli wanted fame in his works. And if that is the case, isn't it ironic that few of the books that were published during his life, uh, the ones that gave him more fame was La Mandragora, <laughs> a, a comedy, gave him fame throughout uh, Italy, and The Art of War. Why didn't he have the, the same eagerness with the prince to make it public and make it a, 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 re, a renowned work? That's a very important question. Why Machiavelli did not publish The Prince in his lifetime? Why he did not publish the discourses on Lily? These are the major words. Now, for the discourses, we know the book remained at the stage of a draft. He never completed it. We know that Machiavelli was never, was never able to produce a final draft. By the way, we don't have the original manuscript of The Prince. We don't have the original manuscript of the discourses either. We have copies of the original text. Reliable, but copies. Now, the answer to the question, Machiavelli was eager of fame. No, he was eager of glory. The difference between fame and glory is simple. The fame is the fact that they speak of you. You're known. But the glory is the bona fama bonorum. It's the good fame of the good people. It requires a higher level of moral excellence to be glorious for Machiavelli. And glory was, the, for Machiavelli, the way to survive, to defeat death, to gain immortality. In this, Machiavelli was a man of the Renaissance. And, but why then he didn't publish The Prince? My answer is he did not publish The Prince because the, the opportunity, the reason, for him to compose that essay emerged in 1513. But it's because the book is an oration the Redeemer, for Machiavelli, who was not a, a professor, was not a professional scholar, he was a citizen politically active, he was a politician, though without political, he was an advisor. So he, for him, it did not make sense to uh, print a book on the Redeemer when it was clear after 1515 that there was no chance of redemption in Italy, that the possibility was gone. That book would have been irrelevant after 1513. Now, however, you have to consider one historical detail that for a man of Machiavelli's time, of his generation, to distribute a manuscript was like to publish it. To allow people to copy it was the same as printing it. So it's true he did not strive to have it published. It was published only, the prince was published only five years after Machiavelli's death, but he allowed it to circulate. The reason why I did not make an effort to print it, as I think, is the one I explained. Since it is a book about the redemption of Italy, he did not want to pursue that idea when it was clear to everyone that there were, that there were no chances whatsoever for a political redemption of Italy. Isaiah Berlin uh, wrote an essay called The, the uh, Originality of Machiavelli. Uh, and I want to change the question to the originality of Biroli. <laughs> because <laughs> because you, have, you have made uh, a, a great uh, analysis of the prince, rescuing the prince from, from bad criticism, in a, in a sense. But you also raise two very important uh, uh, questions about Machiavelli. Was Machiavelli a religious man? <laughs> Did he... Did he use uh, the Bible or, or, or sacred text as, as an inspiration for his works? And in page 101, you mentioned that in the discourses, 
he wrote that he readed the Bible judiciously. And he did it because he wanted to learn from politics and war. That, I think, is part of the originality of, of your interpretation of the prince. How would you judge Machiavelli's religiosity when you have published a book called Machiavelli's God and thinking of a character that has been so much criticized by the church historically? Yes, you're right. You cited Isaiah Berlin. For Isaiah Berlin, uh, the originality of Machiavelli consists in the fact that he was a pagan, that he, he was not following Christian morality, but the pagan, the ancient Roman morality. I think that on this issue, Isaiah Berlin was not right. Machiavelli was never, uh, he, he never wrote sentences that allow us to think that he was a pagan. Nothing. He had what uh, Machiavelli, what we know from the texts is that certainly Machiavelli read the Bible. He read and used the Bible extensively, judiciously, as he says, not in order to find theological truths, but in order to find political wisdom. That's why, for instance, when Machiavelli wants to explain, explain in The Prince, that uh, to use mercenary armies is useless and dangerous to use the weapons of others, the armies of others, auxiliary armies, armies that are under the command of somebody else. He tells the story of Goliath and, uh, and David. So he uses a biblical narration. His works are replete with references to the Bible. That's for sure. Why? And why uh, uh, the religious problem was so important for Mac important for Machiavelli, because Machiavelli believed that only religious people can be free. He said it, chapter 12, Discourses, book one. The examples, the, who were the free peoples he knew of. The Romans, the Romans were religious. The ancient Tuscans, they were deeply religious. Where there did he know of uh, free peoples in his own time, yes, the free German cities that he visited in 1507, but they were Christians, of a very, very rigorous type of Christianity. So for my, my, the conclusion of Machiavelli was straightforward. If you are not religious, you cannot be free. And I can explain you why. All religious peoples of history, he wrote, have been re religious. If you are religious, you can be free. That's why he said Italians cannot be free. Why? <laughs> because noi italiani siamo senza religione cattivi. We Italians, because of the Church of Rome, we are irreligious, senza religione, and cattivi, wicked, therefore I'm free. Can we then uh, extract the idea that he was a religious man? You know, the problem is again the same. If you enter, you try to understand the beliefs of a person, it's extremely difficult. Particularly for a man like Machiavelli, who did not like to open his soul, to reveal himself. But in all his writings, he speaks of God always respectfully. Never, never a word of insult or dismissive. God is the creator for Machiavelli. God is the power who helps redeemers. God loves justice. God is the last resort of afflicted and humiliated human beings. God is the promise of salvation. Now, what do you make of all this? I think that Machiavelli had a God of his own. He believed in a God that was very much the God of the Bible, but interpreted according to principles of political virtue. Allow me to sum up. <coughs> Please, don't think that I'm trying to 
be, to impress. Right. That's none. I think that Machiavelli's God is exactly the God of the Americas. Is that type of God. Is the God that you find in the works of Lincoln, you find in the works of the founders, in the American civic religion. That's the type of God that Machiavelli would have liked to see becoming the center of the new religious sentiment in Italy. What a great answer. Another, another question, and this is, this is a particularly interesting, uh, because Machiavelli has been criticized to be like this sort of a historical advisor to tyrants. <laughs> and, uh, and when you read Gramsci, and you mentioned Gramsci in the book, Gramsci was a communist, communist intellectual leader. How do you think Gramsci got to interpret Machiavelli in a way that his philosophy and thought can be applicable to his views of communism? Well, that's a, a really fascinating story. As you know, Gramsci in jail, he was imprisoned by Mussolini in 1926. He left the prison in 1937 to die in an hospital. Gramsci was a defeated man just like Machiavelli in 1512. Gramsci was the leader of the Italian Communist Party, crushed, of course, by Mussolini. So Gramsci reads Machiavelli in jail. And he writes this line, Il Principe di Machiavelli è un libro vivente. is a living book. is a book that produces political life, that inspires, that motivates. And uh, Gramsci makes the uh, equation between, uh, he calls Machiavelli the theorist of Il Principe Nuovo. What, who would be the prince new? For Gramsci would be the Communist Party. The Communist Party, in the, as Gramsci understood it, should be the creator of new political orders. Just like Machiavelli's redeemer should be the creator of new political orders. So Gramsci makes an analogy. Of course, there is a big difference between the Communist Party and uh, Machiavelli's political leader. Nonetheless, the reason why I think Gramsci perceived very well, understood very well the meaning of the prince, it's simply because Gramsci was in a political and personal condition that was very similar to the condition of Machiavelli in 1512. So he was able to grasp the meaning of of the prince. And I think there is a lot to be said uh, to that, about that interpretation. Gramsci also was absolutely right in stressing that the center of the book is the exhortation. But not only Gramsci. Hegel, too, thought, uh, regarded the exhortation as the center of the prince. So you can see that Machiavelli's message about political redemption found someone capable of understanding it. Not many, but some. For instance, uh, uh, during the Italian Risorgimento, the experience, political experience through which Italy attained independence and political unity, Italians appreciated the prince because of the exhortation. So I mean, what I'm saying is that in order for a political message to be appreciated, you need some particular cultural and political conditions. People willing and capable of listening and uh, understanding the sound and the meaning of the words of Machiavelli's presentation. Gramsci certainly was one. Thank you, Professor. Well, I, I come to my last question with a, with a picture of this place that you mentioned in your in introductory remarks. <laughs> Machiavelli's <laughs> tomb. That's where I go every morning. Uh, you have written Machiavelli and Republicanism. You have written Nicolo's Smile. You have written Machiavelli's God, and you have written Redeeming the Prince. What would be your next challenge uh, on Machiavelli? <laughs> I, I cannot, immense, Machiavelli was right about redemption of Italy. I cannot redeem myself from Machiavelli, it's an obsession. That's why my daughter always said, Babbo, 
non sei stanco di dire sempre le stesse cose. Dad, aren't you tired of saying always the same things? And she, she, she has a point. <laughs> But what can I do about that? My next book on Niccolò will be uh, Niccolò's method uh, to investigate his method for studying politics. Since the usual interpretation is that Machiavelli was a scientist, I will show, in fact, that Machiavelli's method of studying and understanding real politics, real political action was not exactly the method of a political scientist as we understand political science today. Machiavelli was interpreting the meaning of actions. So for instance, typical issue that Machiavelli discussed, is the peace between uh, the king of Spain and the king of France lasting and why have they agreed to strike a peace treaty in April 1st, 1513? Machiavelli tries to respond to this question by understanding the passions, the beliefs, and the ragioni, the reasons for acting of princes. So he wanted to interpret, to decode their intentions. And I think this is exactly what we should do if we want to understand politics, to understand what different political leaders want to attain? What is their goal? How you do that? Uh, for instance, let's, let's consider a typical problem. What will President Obama do with uh, Syria? How do you know? Well, Machiavelli would say, consider the passions of this man, his beliefs, consider the goal that he wants to say, consider the kind of person he is. That, that's not Don't rely on general rules or general laws that say leaders in such and such situations, they behave, normally behave in this way. You have to know what kind of person is that person to be able to predict or at least be able to grasp what he's going to do. And uh, this is a method that they call historical interpretive. And is a method that... Um, I think it's still particularly valuable to understand real politics. My next book will be a critique of prevailing of conventional political science. I teach in the Department of Political Science. I really think that if we want to understand real political life, we should go back to Machiavelli and rediscover his interpretive historical method a method that he says is interpretive because he wants to understand the meanings of actions and historical because he uses historical analogies. So he's going to say this situation resembles another situation you have seen in the past. And from the past we can learn how to deal with the present. Nobody does that anymore, at least not in the context of political science. Political scientists nowadays they use diagrams. They use equations, they use maths. That was not Machiavelli's method. I think to conclude, if we go back to Machiavelli, we can gain on two fronts. First, we can redeem political science <laughs> from its own self-inflicted corruption. And we can redeem our own times from the sense of hopelessness. And we can at least keep alive the idea that grand politics is possible. Thank you, Professor Viroli. It has been a delight to have you here. A delight.